Okay, I think we can probably get started here. <sighs> Been an interesting day in the languages track. I saw a little uh, Perl 6 stuff. Some of it was interesting, some of it was a little scary. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit different now. Uh, I am Charles Nutter. I am one of the two core, or the two lead developers on the JRuby project. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about JRuby today and also try and give you a little perspective on uh, why we feel like JRuby is a, a, a great open source success story and how uh, some of you may be able to help us in the future. So I'm going to go through a quick Ruby intro. How many folks here uh, know Ruby? Okay, probably half, a little bit more than that. So I'm going to run through it fast just to make sure that anybody is, uh, everybody's on the same page at least. Uh, then I'll do a little bit of information on the JRuby background, where it came from, talk about the internal design of it, since that's really my area of expertise. Uh, go through a few use cases where people are using JRuby and then uh, have plenty of time over, left over for questions. So first off, who am I? Uh, Charles Nutter, you can call me Charlie. Uh, I've been working at Sun for about a year now, but I've been doing Java development for over a decade. Uh, working full time on JRuby these days, and also trying to take what we've learned working on JRuby and expand that to other languages and improved language support on the JVM in general. Uh, I've done a lot of other crap in the past. Uh, most of it I don't do anymore. Uh, so what is Ruby? Ruby is a dynamic type language like Perl or Python. Uh, it's pure object oriented, so designed from the beginning to be object oriented, and it shows. It, it, feels a lot more OO than uh, a lot of other dynamic or scripting languages that are available right now. Uh, the, the standard implementation is interpreted. Uh, it's open source and it's written in C and it's reasonably readable code. Uh, but there are some downsides to that implementation written in C. Uh, it's green threaded like a lot of interpreters are. So it doesn't take advantage of multiple cores, doesn't parallelize. Uh, it also doesn't have the greatest Unicode support in the production version. The, there's a development release, Ruby 1.9, which is starting to gain a little bit of a, like, get a little bit of traction. That helps with the Unicode problem, but it doesn't really solve it uh, completely yet. Uh, there's also uh, far, far fewer libraries for Ruby than there are for Java or for other languages that have had more, uh, more users over the years. And uh, by most accounts, Ruby is slow. And of course, performance doesn't really matter until it does. And uh, Ruby tends to run into some particularly bad cases where it's one of the slower languages that are available. Uh, it's older than a lot of people think. Created in 1993, at least the idea came up in 1993, so it's been around for quite a while. Uh, Mott's our benevolent dictator in the Ruby community. Uh, he wanted a language that was more powerful than Perl and more object-oriented than Python. And of course he was referring to Perl 4 or 5 at the time, but I think he's done a pretty good job creating a great language. and We appreciate everything he, he does for it. Uh, pretty active community, and uh, there's a lot of different versions in development. So a quick tour here. Say it's pure object-oriented, so basically everything's an object, even numbers. Uh, this shouldn't be any surprise to most of you that have used any other dynamic languages. Um, all objects are, have a class, so even a number, you can get the class of it, and it's a fixed num. Sing it's single inheritance language. Uh, it's rooted at objects, similar to Java. Uh, and object is the base. So a quick tour of the literals. One of the big things that languages like Ruby, and especially Ruby, provide is a number of different literal syntaxes that make it easier to express uh, different types of data in the code. Uh, some of the more important ones be uh, literal regular expression syntax, literal hash syntax, uh, ideas that are considered for adding into future versions of, for example, Java to try and make those easier. Uh, a couple obvious features you start to see the first day working on Ruby. Uh, the fact that you can do string interpolation uh, makes it easier to build strings out of dynamic content. Uh, you can also over override a bunch of operators. Uh, and the syntax is essentially the same as defining any other method. There's no, no special tricks required. It also supports quickly defining attributes. So if you've used other languages where you need to define get and set for particular attributes in, the, uh, in a given type, uh, Ruby makes it uh, one-liner so that you don't have to do all that. And of course, it's dynamic typed, or duct typing, as some people have started to call it lately. 
Uh, if it waddles like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. So in this example, we're calling the make it waddle method. And all that's required is that the passed in object can waddle. And so a duck and a penguin are okay, octopus doesn't. This would lead to a runtime error, um, but they rarely happen. And generally, if you're testing your code well, you don't see them. So here's a simple class in Ruby. Initialize is the constructor. Here it prints out a message from the instance variable at message. Uh, Ruby tends to follow some of Perl's design using uh, leading sigils for particular types of variables. Uh, and then at the bottom we construct an object just by calling the new method on the type. Ruby also supports closures, which seems to be the, the popular feature to add to languages these days. Uh, but from the beginning, Ruby supported closures because it was based largely on uh, Smalltalk's design, which has had closures. Uh, so here's two formats for doing closures. Uh, the only real difference between them is uh, precedence. And for the most part, people use the do end version for multi-line closures. Uh, at the bottom, we can see that there are two different examples of methods that accept a block. This yield is a keyword that allows you to call the passed in block implicitly. Uh, and the second example allows you to explicitly capture the block in an object and call it directly. So modules are kind of Ruby's way of getting around the fact that it's a single inheritance language. Uh, here you can see that we include an enumerable module. Enumerable provides a whole bunch of features that you might want for an enumerable collection. Uh, being able to select certain elements out of it, being able to sort it, find the max, find the min, uh, and doing all, those, all the other operations. So all that's required for you to turn a type into an enumerable is to include that, that module, mix it in, and define one method, each. And that gives you, gives you all of those other features, just based in terms of each. So you can see at the bottom we're able to do our selects and our sorts. So what's JRuby? Everybody that knows Ruby already is now sighing and saying, okay, good. We can move on to the interesting part here. What is JRuby? JRuby is a Ruby implementation that runs on the JVM, essentially. Uh, we've worked very hard to make it compatible with Ruby 1.8, which is the current standard version. And uh, largely, we want people to just think of JRuby as another Ruby implementation. Uh, so many people that consider JRuby uh, sometimes uh, dismiss it because they say, I don't really like Java, I don't want to work with Java. And uh, so I try and stress this point pretty heavily. JRuby is just Ruby. and You can just write normal Ruby code and never really realize that you're running it on top of the JVM. Uh, we've had lots of contributors, and I'll get into some of these guys a little bit more. We're aiming for compatibility with the current version of Ruby. We haven't started work on the 1.9 development version, uh, but we don't expect, don't expect that most of the 1.9 features are going to be too difficult to support. Now, we've had a couple of releases recently. We're working on our big 1.1 release, which I'll talk about soon. So why do I think that JRuby is really an open source success story? Uh, well, the interesting thing about JRuby is that none of the original developers of the project are even involved anymore. There were uh, a number of folks that wrote the original parser and the original interpreter and some of the original libraries. And they've all moved on to other things. And in fact, when Tom and I really, Tom Enabo, the other uh, lead developer, and I started really getting our stride on JRuby, uh, that was pretty much at the point where a lot of folks considered JRuby was dead and that it was a, a done project. No one was ever going to actually make it work. And that was probably about three years or so ago now. Uh, but in that amount of time, we've managed to make it one of the better Ruby implementations. Uh, the other half of this is that the vast majority of code in JRuby is completely from unpaid contributors. Tom and I have been working for Sun for a little over a year now, but we did two years of work before that on our own time, and almost all the other code in the system has actually been contributed from other folks. We're trying to get more people paid to work on it, uh, especially since a lot of people are starting to use JRuby, but there's no way that JRuby would exist in its current state without lots and lots of contributors that have helped out. And what we're seeing now is that some of the pieces of code and some of the frameworks that we've developed for JRuby are starting to see use outside of the project. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later, too. So a little JRuby design overview. Does everybody know how VMs and language interpreters are designed here? All right. Well, some of this will be a review for one or two of you. 
uh, some of the, the, the geekier of us. And, and the rest will be hopefully interesting for all of us. Uh, so the, the design of the Lexer and Parser, basically we have a handwritten Lexer. Uh, it's originally ported from the C code, and it's had lots of changes since then, uh, largely because whenever you take a piece of C code and port it to Java, you don't end up with particularly good Java. Uh, so it's been rewritten, and it's uh, pretty clean and, and performs a lot better now. Uh, the parser is also a port of uh, the C implementation. MRI here stands for Moss's Ruby implementation, uh, a typical acronym we use to describe that. Uh, so we just ported the grammar, and actually it was folks before us that ported the grammar over uh, using J. I think we're one of only two projects in the world that actually use J to generate our parser, mono being the other one. Uh, and uh, as a result, we get a parser out of it. And I don't really use the parser, and I hate working on parsers, so I'm going to move on. One detail, one little OS, OSS angle for this is the fact that our parser has actually enabled most of the Ruby tooling that's out there. Um, most of the tools that are available, or the ones that are getting wide use, are written, written in Java. And they basically all use our parser and our AST. Uh, because it's open source, they can just co-opt that piece of code. And as a result, we've ended up with excellent Ruby support in IDEs, like uh, especially NetBeans, but also in some of the Eclipse-based ones and uh, in the others. So the core classes of JRuby, uh, in general, we have a one-to-one -one mapping between the core Ruby classes and the, Java, and the Java classes that we implement them with. So we have a Ruby string and a Ruby array class that implements string and array. Um, to make it a little easier to bind all of those methods into Ruby, we use Java annotations. Uh, there's, very, uh, there's a few other Java 5 features that we're actually using, uh, and uh, they've helped a lot. Uh, in a lot of cases, we've just ported the existing Ruby implementations of those classes to try and match compatibility one-to-one. -one. And in other cases, we've implemented our own versions, uh, especially in cases where the original implementation didn't map well to, uh, to Java code. So I'll, I'll you know, demonstrate just a little bit of what some of this code looks like, just so you can see. All right, so here's a quick example of the annotation that we're using. Uh, we've got our Java method G sub. And in order to bind that into our Ruby string class, uh, we have a G sub, uh, we have a JRuby method annotation. And the annotation tells us what the actual method names will be. There can be a list of those for alias methods. How many, uh, require, how many arguments are required, how many are optional, uh, and then various other characteristics that we can use to optimize it, like whether we need to allocate a call frame for it, things along those lines. Uh, and this has made it a whole lot simpler to actually generate the code that binds a particular method into Ruby. Uh, let's see, another good example of this would be a simple 2s method. So here's a method where we actually have two different names for it, or in this case, it's just the same method used for two different purposes, and we bind it in, and uh, it's available in Ruby code. So we'll go back in here. All right, so just a little view of what it looks like to actually write some code for the, uh, the Ruby core classes. And so the, the open source angle for this is being able to share a lot of the knowledge that we've gained about the way Ruby works. Uh, Ruby does not have a specification, and that's made it pretty challenging to actually implement the language. Uh, doing these ports directly has in helped us ensure that we're compatible with what Ruby does. And at the same time, we write a lot of tests, and we help other people write tests. And uh, it's made it more specified, not completely specified, but more specified than it used to be. Uh, the port that we've done and the code that we've ported over it makes it a lot easier for other implementations to figure out what the heck's going on inside Ruby. Uh, right now, there are no less than four different Ruby ports that are under active development, uh, probably two or, th two or maybe three of those that are actually probably going to go somewhere. And I believe almost all of them look at our code because the C code is a little bit difficult to follow. And a lot of them are writing these things in uh, open uh, and object-oriented languages that are a little friendlier. So another half of this is that we want to do as much of the heavy lifting once as possible. Uh, some of the contributors that we have here, some of the big ones, um, Ola. Does anybody here know Ola or have heard of him, read his blog? Here's a couple. 
Uh, Ola done, did some of the early work on helping us get Ruby to, JRuby to run Rails. Uh, and probably the biggest contribution was his implementation of two different YAML parsers. YAML is a, a markup language that Rails uses for configuration. And it's used in other parts of Ruby as well. Uh, and his RB YAML port, it was a, actually a pure Ruby YAML parser, is now being used by some of, by a, a Rubi, Rubinius, which is a Ruby written in Ruby, essentially. And the JV YAML port that he did is being looked at for, by the Iron Ruby project for .NET so that they'll have a YAML parser. So already we're, we're kind of helping out some of the other projects. Uh, Marson, he, he did probably the most amazing piece of porting work that I've ever seen. Uh, we, have in, we have had in a, pro a problem in JRuby where the Java regular expression engines, since they work with normal Java characters, uh, were a performance problem for us because Ruby's strings are all based on bytes. And we figured we might always have to deal with that problem until Marson said, oh, I think I can probably port this Onigaruma library that they're using for Ruby 1.9. And uh, porting any regular expression engine or implementing any regular expression engine is a non-trivial task. But Onigaruma is probably one of the most complicated engines out there, largely because it allows you to have pluggable character encodings. So you don't have to say what character you're encoding you're running this regular expression over if you can provide the plug-in code that manages that encoding. And uh, I think it was in about October, Marson said, yeah, I think I, can, I think I can try and port this. We figured, okay, it'd probably take a few months for him to get it done. Uh, and about a month later, he actually had it finished and all working. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it was faster than the original C implementation. So amazing piece of work. Uh, I'm actually hoping to, to work with and, and help Marson uh, expand this so it can work with Java characters and possibly push this through as a, as a replacement for the Java regex library to cover some of the edge cases where it has some issues. Uh, Tom, very recently he's been working on a POSIX lookalike for Java. Has, has anybody here ever tried to do process management or any of those sorts of things in Java? It's pretty brutal uh, and it's the features available are just uh, not what you need to actually do good process management. Uh, even beyond that, you talk about things like symbolic links and uh, features that basically exist on almost all operating systems. Java still doesn't have a way to support them. So using uh, this library JNA, I'll talk a little bit about that later, uh, Tom has worked on basically a POSIX or libc lookalike for some of these features. So that in Java code, you can have access to sim links, you can have access to process control, uh, and I actually added fork to it, which is a little frightening. Uh, so then uh, the pieces I've done, most of them haven't gotten out into the general uh, language implementation domain yet, but uh, all of the code generation stuff that we've done, uh, all the support to try and make dynamic languages run faster, all the compiler tools, that's mostly the bits that I've been working on, and I'm hoping to start bringing that to a wider audience very soon so it can be general purpose for other language implementers on the JVM. So the design of the interpreter, uh, JRuby has traditionally been interpreted just like the C implementation, and we still have an interpreter right now, uh, at least for when we run in interpreted mode. That's a simple switch-based AST walker, uh, like a lot of interpreters are. Uh, recursively, recursively digs down into the tree and executes, uh, and currently most code starts out interpreted while JRuby runs. Uh, this is to make it a little quicker to run evaluated code, compiling is expensive, and to allow for people to run with typical Ruby scenario where you have a, dot, a bunch of source files on disk and you want to execute them. So we generally start out with the interpreter for, for almost all execution. So now the interesting thing for open source side of this is how rapidly this has changed. Uh, new interpreters were the first three major contributions that I made to JRuby, various rewrites, uh, in the middle, we had a very slow and overambitious stackless interpreter, which sort of worked. You could do recursive fib to a million, things like that. But uh, eventually, we uh, started to fall under the weight of the slow performance. And then kind of we settled on this third interpreter version. That, uh, it's the smallest piece of code, and the smallest interpreter that we've had, uh, the simplest and actually the fastest. So it's probably going to be the, the main interpreter for quite a while. But we are also working on a bytecode interpreter, similar to Ruby 1.9 or Python, uh, to try and eliminate that uh, interpreter engine as uh, any sort of performance bottleneck when you're starting up a piece of code. 
So the area that I've been spending most of my time on for the past nine months is working on JRuby's compiler. Uh, in JRuby 1.1, we, we can compile Ruby code completely down to Java bytecode. And uh, it's anywhere from two to five times faster than running it in interpreted mode, and usually faster than all of the uh, existing implementations of Ruby. Uh, so the general idea is that uh, an AST walker that's very similar to the interpreter just walks through the code uh, and makes calls into a bytecode emitter. And that bytecode emitter generates Java classes containing methods for all of the bodies of code. Uh, it's not really a Java class that you can instantiate. It doesn't look like a normal Java type. Uh, but it's essentially just sort of a bag of methods that we then bind at runtime uh, so that you can call them as bytecode rather than an, through the interpreter. And there's two modes that we run with. Uh, you can do ahead of time compilation and take an entire application full of Ruby files, turn them all into Java class files, and run your application that way. Uh, that ends up working out pretty well. Uh, it doesn't save us much on startup because there is still class verification cost and loading all that bytecode into memory. But it does allow you to have everything compiled from the start, so you don't have to wait for it to JIT. And that brings me to the second version. This is what most people will run with. Uh, in JIT mode, JRuby actually will run most of the code interpreted, and it will watch to see which methods are the hottest, eventually compiling them into bytecode. So as your application runs, just like the rest of the JVM, it'll eventually be compiled down and run a lot faster. And from there, then, uh, the JVM can take it and do whatever native code jitting it wants to do. And that's helped us keep Ruby looking basically the same and feeling the same when you run it in JRuby, but still get the performance out of compilation. And it also makes it a lot more complicated to design. Um, but there's a couple different open source sides to this. Uh, I, as far as I know, nobody's ever done a mixed mode uh, language implementation on top of a general purpose VM like this. Uh, so it's kind of a new idea, and it ended up working out well for us. So Rubinius, XRuby, some of the other implementations that are out there of Ruby have started to follow our lead in a lot of ways, uh, running with interpreted or bytecode engines for a while and then trying to look at jitting things down. And of course, this isn't really a new idea, but the idea of applying it to dynamic language like Ruby uh, was, is, was not their first, first idea. Uh, and unfortunately, Iron Ruby wishes they could, but uh, since we have a GPL license attached, uh, the poor Microsoft guys are not allowed to look at our code. That's too bad. Uh, but we talk to them and, and we re -rib them once, rib them once in a while about their uh, open source initiatives. Uh, so anyway, moving on. Uh, we're also trying to turn this into more general purpose compiler tools. So any folks that are interested in other languages on the JVM will have less work to do to create them. Uh, especially as regards making them perform well. Uh, there's a lot of tricks that we've had to do in JRuby to make Ruby run well. Um, and uh, we're trying to find ways to make that gen general purpose so that everybody can play with them. On the other side, uh, we're working with a lot of the core JVM engineers, and especially John Rose, on improving the JVM for languages in the future. Uh, John's very interested in, at least for Java 7, trying to get dynamic invocation in so that it can be optimized so that you have a lot less work to do to make dynamic languages fast on the JVM. He's also working on uh, what he calls the DaVinci machine. That's basically a multi-language spin-off from OpenJDK that will provide a whole bunch of other language features like tail calls, uh, continuations, a lot of things people never expected to even see in the JDK or on Java are going to, going to come to light in the MLVM. And I believe that's what John Rose is working on full time right now, is adding some of those features and working on the dynamic language support. So that's pretty cool. Um, so I'm going to show a little bit of the compiler and what, what the code actually looks like here, if I can bring it up quick. All right, hopefully this font isn't going to be too absurd. So in order to make this compiler easier to design, easier to read, and because I don't know anything about compilers, um, it was designed to have two halves. The half that actually walks through the AST doesn't know anything about the bytecode generation at all. Uh, it's completely separated from the code. So here we have a compile method uh, at the top of the compiler. And you'll see what generally would look like a typical interpreter. Uh, for each type of node, it's going to call a particular method to handle it. And if we look at the interpreter, 
which surprisingly enough is, is named AST interpreter. And we go down to the main evaluation method for the interpreter. You see what's almost the same code. The alias nodes and all the other nodes are just defined as methods in a large switch. So that's, that's by design to try and keep the compiler reasonable and uh, certainly more readable. So then what you actually have once you dig into the code is you have this method compiler context and for each step of the way the AST walker will call into the method compiler to do something. Uh, there's a number of core operations like creating primitive types, uh, creating methods, just defining blocks of code. And so it makes it a lot simpler to actually implement the compiler since the AST side doesn't have to know how to generate any AST code. Now, to show you something a little bit more exciting and scary, we'll actually show you what some of the code generation looks like. Uh, let's look at the stack-based compiler. So one of the things this allows us to do is to actually have a pluggable compiler system. Uh, all we have as far as the as far as the AST walker goes, is a set of interfaces. And one of those is some sort of variable compiler for accessing variables and setting variables. And we have multiple implementations of those to allow for various types of performance optimizations. One of those optimizations is to use Java's variables rather than to create our own array full of a bunch of, uh, bunch of values. So here we have a stack-based variable compiler and then we take a look at the code that actually does a variable lookup. Well, here's a variable assignment. That's an easy one. Given that there's probably a, ver there's a value already available in the stack, we make a copy of it and do a Java A store operation. And so in this way, we can actually generate all of the bytecode that goes behind the scenes in JRuby. And if anybody's interested in compiler stuff, I'd love to have people look at this and tell me if I'm a total lunatic. It works pretty well. But, uh, you know, it, it's uh, my first attempt at a compiler, and uh, it's been an adventure. Are there any compiler designers or compiler writers here? A couple? Yeah, there's not a lot of us around, so. And uh, two years ago, I didn't know anything about writing compilers, designing languages, VMs, none of that. So any one of you within the next year or two could be writing compilers, too. Aren't you excited about that? Okay. So let's <clears throat> talk a little bit about some of the compiler perf performance optimizations we've done. And this is a little dry, so I'm going to move through it pretty quickly. Um, caching literals is kind of an old trick. Uh, trying to use Java opcodes as much as possible for various language features. Uh, and then local variables kind of fits into that, too. Uh, trying to use Java primitives, Java systems, uh, for as much as we can. We've also got some basic inline method caching just to speed up method lookup and to, to make it a little quicker for dynamic invocations. And lots of stuff that we can play with, lots of areas we can fiddle with it and uh, improve the performance over time. So another way that we do some optimization is in our core classes. I mentioned that they were ported from Ruby. One of the ways that Ruby gets what performance it does have is by having copy on write implementations of strings and arrays. Uh, it has a, a fast hash implementation. Uh, and then we've also started using all of the Java new I.O. NIO library to do our I.O. implementation so that it maps directly to the way Ruby works. And uh, I tell you, one of, the, one of the biggest challenges there is actually trying to implement what's essentially libc I.O. with uh, all the NIO classes. Uh, and then JNA, I, I mentioned a little earlier, is a, a native layer for calling into C libraries. Uh, and it m turns out to be a whole lot faster than actually shelling out the CH mod, for example. Uh, it's not too surprising. And then, of course, the, the regular expression implementation I talked about, uh, the Onigaruma port named Joni that Marson did. So the open source side here is, is probably the most interesting in the regular expression area. Again, we've been through four different regular expression implementations for JRuby, trying to find one that works well for us. Of course, we started out with a normal Java regular expression library, but uh, the java.regex code will actually blow up if you do an alternation over a large content because uh, it recurses. And so it's really fast, but it also doesn't work for a lot of types of input. Uh, we then started moving to jregex, which is a third-party regular expression library 
uh, with more of a compiled engine. Uh, but it is also character based, so it was much too much encoding and decoding overhead for us to be able to make it work. Um, then we really decided we had to make a, we had to have a port of uh, a regular expression engine that would work well for us. Uh, the first one that was started was a direct port of Ruby's regular expression engine. And it wasn't as fast as JRegex, but it did save us some of the encoding and decoding overhead. Of course, once we had Onigaruma, uh, there was really not, uh, really no other choice. And uh, it, says here, it says here in progress, but it's going to ship with JRuby 1.1, and it's basically done. And it, it did turn out to be the holy grail for us. So the POSIX stuff, uh, anybody that's done any Java development and, and tried to work with uh, lower level parts of the system realizes that Java's APIs are, a lot of them are pretty far behind the times. Uh, process management, there just really isn't any good way to do in Java. You can spin up processes and hopefully that they'll run appropriately and uh, you'll get a result back. But if, if you want to be able to control them or send signals or do I.O., normal I.O. to processes, it's terribly painful. The file system operations are also a big one that's a problem for Java. Uh, you cannot work with file descriptors directly. You can't change uh, file system modes. You can't change ownership. You can't even work with symbolic links, even though they've been around for, you know, decades now. Uh, so uh, we ended up using this JNA library. It's not JNI. It's called Java Native Access. It essentially allows us to programmatically call into any C library from Java code without writing any C code at all. Uh, so we use this to load in libc, for example, to be able to make all the calls to symlinks and chmod and other, other, other functions that are available there. Uh, if you've ever used Ruby, it's similar to the DL library. It lets you just call into any arbitrary uh, C library. And then we've also started using NIO to emulate libc IO behavior. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an adventure reading glibc code to figure out how it works. Um, so back to some, now we get to some use cases here to kind of talk about where JRuby is being used. One big use case, and, and it's unusual that this is such a big use case, but it's uh, doing GUI applications with Swing. Uh, the big problem with Swing, the standard GUI library for Java, is that it's just too complicated. And, and really when I say complicated, it's not designed for humans to be using directly most of the time. Uh, it's just too large and it's kind of, it kind of should be a lower level library that you build an application framework on top of. Unfortunately, none of those application frameworks have really ever materialized, so people still write raw Swing code. Uh, Ruby actually makes Swing a whole lot easier uh, and a lot cleaner and easier to understand, and it makes it easier to build some sorts of language frameworks on, or some sorts of application frameworks on top of it. So I'm going to do a quick demo of what it looks like to do Swing stuff in JRuby using a uh, interactive console here. All right, is that big enough for everybody in the back there too? Yeah, it's good enough. So this will be interesting to try and type and talk at the same time. Okay, so like most uh, scripting languages or dynamic languages, uh, Ruby has a little interactive shell called IRB. Our version of it is JIRB, because naturally we have to stick a J on the beginning of everything. Uh, this is running under a JVM, so obviously we should be able to pull in Java code. And so I'll just require in Java, the Java library we have. Uh, the false there means that it was probably already loaded, and I think that's a side effect of uh, JIRB. But then we can actually start calling into normal Java code directly. So if I do java.lang system out print line with some text, you see that it actually writes out. And what's more, it really can end up looking a lot like normal Java code. So for example, if I want to pull in some swing classes, we'll import them, java x swing j frame. All right, we know that swing is awake. Uh, and then I'll construct a frame here using normal Ruby syntax with some title. Okay, so we get our wonderful swing logging output there. And this is all live code and live objects, so 
will show our frame, and it should be in the back here somewhere. There. So there we have our little frame, and I don't want to have to keep clicking over there, so we'll do always on top equals true, and it's always on top. And we will set the size to something a little bit more viewable. We'll say like 400 by 400. Okay, now we have a bigger window. And now of course it's a frame that has nothing in it, so it's not particularly interesting. We'll import another class here, Java X Swing J Button. And I'll make a button. Press me and add it to the frame. Okay, now in order to have it lay itself out, we'll have it show. And we've got the button in there. It all seems to be working just fine. And of course, now we want to make the button actually do something. So we will attach an action listener to it. Uh, and now the nice thing about Ruby is that since we have closures, we don't necessarily have to create a whole separate class to implement an action listener. We'll just pass a closure into it and JRuby will do the magic of creating a class for us behind the scenes. So here we have our button and we will add action listener. And notice that this is all Ruby uh, standard syntax for these. Uh, we do support the uppercase or camel cased versions of all these methods, but when I started looking at code that had all the camel cases in it next to the regular Ruby code, I realized that it was a little ugly. So we ended up adding the ability to just use underscore casing so it fits well into the rest of your Ruby code. So I will add an action listener, uh, but what I'll actually do is I'll just give it a closure. And that closure will take the button and set the text to something new. Okay. So we've added our action listener. And now hopefully if it works right, there. So that's a little bit easier than actually implementing a class for an action listener, right? Uh, and uh, you can do this with basically any Java library too. We try to be as smart as possible about how you uh, turn a closure into uh, a class implementation. Of course, action listener only has one method on it, but if there were multiple methods, you can specify parameters to the closure that say which one was called. And so you can have a single closure implement an entire class for you. Makes it a heck of a lot easier to do uh, a lot of swing stuff. So I'll go back to the slides here. And I bet this is going to bug me, so I'm going to get rid of that. All right. So you can see, kind of see why a lot of folks are interested in using Ruby to do swing development. And there's actually some people doing commercial work with it. Uh, the second use case that really has helped Ruby come into the mainstream is web development. Uh, and of course, classic Java web development is a little bit too complicated. Uh, it's never really found the framework that makes it easy or pleasant to, to do Java web development. And it turns out that almost all the new frameworks that people are writing for Java and for other languages are kind of following Rails lead now. Uh, Rails has really made it a whole lot simpler to actually develop web applications. And so the natural case for us in JRuby was to get Rails running on Java. Uh, Rails also improves on a lot of Java web application development because it's so over configured in the Java world. You can essentially can't, you can do anything, um, but you have to write configuration to do almost all of it. And of course Java tends to be a little too Add a little too verbose for a lot of work that you do on uh, web applications. A third use case that a lot of people have been using JRuby for is for doing test-driven and behavior-driven development. Uh, these are kind of ingrained into the Ruby community, uh, but it's really damn hard to do test-driven development in Java if you have to have all the code compiling to run it. Uh, being able to use a dynamic language like Ruby to do test-driven development means you can write all of your tests and you can run them and you can see there's failures because the code it's testing doesn't exist yet. But then you can go and fill in the blanks. You can start actually writing the code that goes along with it. And in the case of JRuby, you can actually write code in Ruby that tests all of your Java classes. So we'll take a look at uh, two examples of how this actually looks. Here is uh, using the test unit framework. This is a standard testing framework for Ruby, and what most, most of them use for test-driven development. Uh, but we're actually pulling in a Java class, server socket, and writing some tests against it. 
And now, if we were living in a world where a server socket didn't exist, we could still have this code and we could run it and we could see that it fails because server socket isn't present and then go on and continue from there, uh, letting the test drive our development. Uh, in this case, we test the server socket by constructing it and making sure it has the port that we specified for it. it makes it a lot simpler. Uh, a second example here with also using server socket is using RSpec. Now, RSpec is sort of a behavior driven or specification driven development where instead of expecting you to add comments to all of your tests or to all of your code, uh, the specification itself actually has descriptions of what's going on. So it does do tests and it does test your code like a regular testing framework does, but you can also tell it to just dump out all of the text, all of the specifications that you've written. And that lets you say server socket should know its own port or server socket should know its own port comes out of the RSpec tool as a specification document for server socket. So I got, uh, I got about 10 minutes left on the normal talk and then I want to have lots of time for any questions. So a few things that I'd like people to take away from this. Uh, having Ruby and really having lots of languages on the JVM, but having Ruby on the JVM opens lots of possibilities. Uh, it's finally making a lot of these Java APIs, which have really outstanding APIs and outstanding implementations, a lot more approachable. Uh, when you make APIs that are going to stand the test of time, you sometimes make them a little more complicated than they need to be. They need to be flexible. They need to last forever. And Swing is still an excellent API for doing GUI work. It's just too damn big to do in Java code. Uh, Ruby also fits in really well with a lot of the existing libraries. Uh, taking the example of Swing again, it seems like just a natural fit. Uh, and especially since in the Ruby world, there is no really good cross-platform way to do GUIs. Uh, being able to use something like Swing is a natural fit for it. And JRuby really is more than just a Ruby implementation. We're trying to open up Ruby to all of what's available in the Java world, all of the libraries, the outstanding VM and the garbage collector, all of these pieces that don't really exist in the Ruby world. Uh, we're trying to push Ruby forward a little bit too, trying to find a way to make Ruby uh, as, as natural on the JVM as any other language. And of course, we really thrive on open source development. Uh, and we really hope that anyone that sees our talks or tries JRuby or plays with it We'll see how they can contribute. And it's really not that difficult. We try and make the code as approachable as possible. Uh, and from that, here's some more information. Uh, JRuby sites. If you're interested in NetBeans, I mentioned it's one of the best uh, Ruby IDEs that are out there. It really does some amazing things with code completion right now, and it's getting better every day. There's the link for it. Uh, Ruby, if you need more information on that, seems like most of you probably know Ruby, but there's a link for it. And really, if you want to talk more about this or you want to help out, stop into the JRuby channel on Freenode. Uh, and we're, we have folks in there 24 hours a day that are awake and talking about stuff, uh, mainly because the entire team is scattered over the whole planet. And we'd love to hear from you. And uh, I'd especially love to hear from you individually if there's anything, any questions you have or any thoughts you have about JRuby. So there's my address, and feel free to email me. So we're ready. I think we're ready for questions. Thanks. All right, any questions at all? Language design, JVM stuff, There's one right here. Is there a microphone going around or does this one work? So the question was, do we have any plans to support Ruby 1.9? Yes, we do. Uh, right now we're focusing on, in the 1.1 release, getting Ruby 1.8 stuff to run really well. Uh, most of the compatibility issues have kind of been wrapped up and the performance is looking great. We're trying to solve a few more bottlenecks. Um, but after we get 1.1 out, we will start supporting Ruby 1.9 features. Uh, at, 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 the first, at first, you'll have to specify a flag that'll turn on all 1.9 features and you'll be running in 1.9 mode. Uh, but I'd like to have individual settings so that if you want just Ruby 1.9 support for the literal Lambda syntax, for example, you could turn that on and still have the rest of Ruby 1.8 intact. Uh, and that's one of the big things we're going to be working on after 1.1's out probably by the end of the month. All right, other questions? Right in front here. 
Thank you. Um, what is the most important feature uh, from the MLVM uh, projects beside GSR 292 that would give like the best performance uh, boost to JRuby and other dynamic uh, languages? Okay. So, what is the most important feature? Well, JSR 292, for those that don't know, is the invoke dynamic JSR, which intends to add fast dynamic invocation to some version of the JVM. And hopefully we can get it into to JDK 7. Uh, well, the, the pieces that are being added to JSR 292 are, are definitely the most important, and they're the ones that we're trying to get out there. Dynamic invocation, along with the ability to create lightweight method handles, uh, and a number of other features that make it simpler. In the multi-language VM, what would be the most important? I suppose it depends which language you're implementing for the most part. Uh, the, the ability to do tail calls and have the JVM optimize them is going to be a big one for a lot of languages. And uh, the lack of tail call optimization is one thing that's kept a lot of functional languages from, having, from being hosted well on the JVM. So that's probably going to be the biggest one. It's the showstopper that stopped a lot of other languages from getting, in, getting into the system. Um, I, would, I would say that they're probably all going to be just about equally important because they all enable some type of language or some type of optimization that's going to help it. Uh, John Rose, if you look him up, uh, he's got a blog where he's been talking about things like tail calls, continuation support, and he has like prototypes for all this stuff in his back pocket. Um, continuations, uh, tuples, a uh, bunch of other optimizations. Uh, one, one other one that I'd really like to get in the multi-language VM is something like JNA, the Java native library that lets you call C code, as standard, as part of the JDK. So that not only can everybody use it to call arbitrary C libraries, but it'll optimize it down. So when it eventually jits the code, it just becomes a call to the C library directly. Lots of cool stuff could come out of that. All right. Right here. Hi. I uh, remember reading a um, few months or maybe a year ago someone's um, opinion that um, I, that it was going to be very difficult in JRuby to implement continuations. But from what you're saying, it sounds like um, you've managed that. How did you do it, and is it actually done? In JRuby, we do not support Ruby's continuations. Uh, because we can't manipulate the Java call stack directly, there's no way to do it on current JVMs without taking a massive performance hit. And both JRuby and IronRuby, which is for the CLR, have opted to not implement it, not implement continuations right now. Lucky for us, continuations are so slow in the C implementation of Ruby that nobody really uses them for actual work. So the vast majority of code out there, 99.9% .9 doesn't use continuations. Now all that said, we would like to be able to support continuations and, and really continuations little brothers uh, coroutines in a future version of JRuby. And that's why that support is probably going to get into MLVM, into the DaVinci machine at some point, so that we can do efficient coroutines on the JVM. Yeah, one more. Up in the back there. And you can come up and talk to me after, and I'll be around, so. I'm, um, I'm not uh, too versed in uh, dynamic uh, languages, but um, I have dabbled with compilers a bit in, uh, in the past. And uh, besides just getting the compiler to work and the resulting code to perform, there are sometimes uh, smaller issues like uh, actual compilation speed or um, uh, the, the quality of uh, the error messages that are, uh, especially in a first implementation, are yeah, not as good as usual. Could you com comment on that? Uh, did you have a lot of, have to put in a lot of work in getting a decent error generation uh, from JRuby, from the compiler? Well, I'm hoping to be able to take what we've done with JRuby to make it easier to write compilers and, you know, maybe an eventual goal similar to what Microsoft guys are doing with DLR, where you don't actually have to write the compiler, you just write. Uh, an abstract tree that represents your language and a compiler pops out the other end. Um, that's an ambitious goal, but at the very least, I want to take what we've learned and try to write better compiler tools for folks writing stuff on the JVM. So that, for example, you don't have to be doing a lot of raw bytecode emitting yourself. You don't have to be doing your own stack management. Um, you, and, for example, regular uh, um, exceptions are terribly difficult to, uh, to wire in correctly. 
uh, if you've never used them before. So we don't have a whole lot of facilities in JRuby that would be general purpose right now, but I think the design that we came up with for our compiler could be expanded into a more of a general purpose uh, code generation library for the JVM. Yeah, but I didn't re mean really mean code generation, just pointing uh, the right token uh, that causes an error during the compilation uh, process, for instance. Okay. Because that's quite often uh, yeah, a, a somewhat forgotten uh, part of, of building compilers. All oh, right. Yeah, we haven't really done anything specific in that area, so uh, I'd be interested in hearing you know, what sort of specific problems you're talking about. All right, and I think that's all the time we have. I'll be around, so feel free to talk to me, and uh, thanks.